Yes. Uh, this afternoon and into tomorrow, uh, we're going to um, be hearing about the work and um, actions and um, uh, uh, views of Dr. Harold Gunson. Um, in the same way that Ms. Richards made clear with Professor Cash, Dr. Gunson was a key figure in the uh, uh, English blood service. Um, and there are many thousands of documents that one could look at to explore uh, what he thought about things, and what he did, um, and he was involved for, for very many years. So inevitably, the, um, the documents that we've drawn attention to, both in the written presentation and over the next uh, day or so in the oral presentation, are, are, are selective. Um, but I, I hope that by... Um, going to some of the documents, we'll get an idea of what his views were about some of the key issues uh, that we're going to be exploring in the coming hearings and um, what action he took and what part he took in some of the key decisions um, uh, that, were take, uh, that were taken over the relevant period. Um, I I'm going to start by looking at his CV, which is NHBT uh, 5025 underscore 002, and it's page 16 of that document. We can see there um, his name. Uh, and if we go over to the following page and pick it up at the bottom of that page, we can see um, beginning in 1953, resident cl clinical pathologist, and then a number of um, appointments in Canada uh, returning in 1959 uh, to take up a role as a senior hospital medical officer in a regional transfusion centre in Manchester. Um, he then became the consultant in charge of the transfusion centre in Lancaster from 1964 to, to 1975, and uh, 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 while in that post became a, an honorary consultant <coughs> to the Lancaster district of Lancashire Area Health Authority. Um, and then from September 1975 to March 1980, he became the director of the Oxford Regional Transfusion Service. Uh, and from um, April 1980 to uh, October 1988, he was the director of the North Western Regional Blood Transfusion Service, which was based in Manchester. Uh, and then if we go up to the top of the page, we can see um, that he then from there moved... Uh, in October 1988 uh, to become the National Director of the National Directorate of the NBTS and we heard on Tuesday the circumstances in which that post was uh, created uh, and then in April 1993 he was appointed the first Medical Director of the National Blood Authority um, until his retirement in July 1994 and then we can see from July 1994 until the time that that document was written um, he, um, although being retired, uh, actually held a, a post as a part-time consultant to the National Blood Authority. Um, and my, my current understanding is that primarily his role during that period was in response to uh, litigation. But um, uh, it, it may be there is more information um, that will bring a uh, different complexion to that period of his uh, working life. Um, so those are the roles that he undertook. Um, just picking up, Im importantly, um, under present appointment, the penultimate um, entry there, October 1981 to, to July 1994, we can see that overlapping with his uh, many of his uh, posts, and in particular his uh, directorship of, of Manchester and his role in the, in the National Directorate and the, and the NBA, he was appointed the consultant advisor on blood transfusion to the chief medical officer at the Department of Health and Social Security, and then, um, uh, of course, when it became the Department of Health. <coughs> I'm just going to look at a couple of documents which gives us some insight into how he uh, viewed that particular role. So the first one is CBLA 301498. And we can see that that's a, uh, 
It's a letter written on the 16th of November 1981, um, so shortly after he'd been appointed consultant advisor. It's headed on the Manchester National Blood Transfusion Service paper. Dear colleague, and if we go to the um, uh, second page, we can see it's from um, uh, Dr. Gunson. And then if we go back, please, to the first page, it's the third paragraph down, as you are aware, um, uh, the post of consultant advisor is a personal one, and the advice proffered is therefore personal also. However, it would be foolish for advice to the DHSS to be out of line with general views on a particular topic. In this regard, I intend to keep in touch with Bill Wagstaff and the chairman of divisions, would also hope to keep myself informed of matters and problems in the various regions which could have national importance. I hope you will feel that you can discuss these with me or write and let me know about them. Also, I would appreciate agendas and minutes from the various working parties. If you wish me to attend any meetings of a working party where you think the discussions will be helpful, I will endeavour to do so. The same applies to the meetings of the Western and Eastern Divisions. Uh, I'll come on in a moment to look at some of the working groups and committees that Dr. Gunson attended. Um, and so we can see their role is a personal one, but he is going to keep himself very much up to date with what others are thinking and what decisions and actions are being taken. Uh, and then the second document uh, which uh, throws some light on this is uh, NHBT 0018339. Now, this we can see is a, a minute of a regional transfusion director's meeting on the 7th of October 1981. Um, and we can see about halfway down the list of those who are present, it, Dr. Gunson's name. Um, and we can see at the bottom uh, that that meeting is chaired by Dr. Wagstaff, who we saw mentioned in the previous um, document. If we then go over the page, please, to page 7... We can see at item 11, uh, consultant advisor to DHSS. In view of Dr. Tovey's retirement, Dr. Gunson has been asked to fulfill this role. And then skipping down um, to uh, two thirds of the way down that paragraph, what he does there is he, he describes the different administrative arrangements that are going to be, namely that he's going to discharge his role from Manchester, not from London, because he's going to continue in his role as director of the Manchester Centre. Um, so I'll pick it up. With the, it says, where statements, um, uh, where statements had to be made on behalf of the DHSS, this would be done by DHSS and not by the consultant advisor to the DHSS. Dr Gunson expressed his willingness to attend any meetings of working parties or regional groups at which his contribution might be useful. Uh, so echoing what he says in his later letter. But... Uh, in, importantly, he says this, he saw his role as reflecting the views of the RTDs and NBTS at large and communicating these to the DHSS where appropriate. So a slightly different uh, complexion there to the role. Um, in that later letter, he says it's a personal one and I'll be uh, expressing my personal views. But here he seems to be saying, uh, suggesting that he may be rather more of a representative voice of RTDs to the DHSS. Um, and, and then I'll just um, take you to a document NHBT 5086 underscore 009. Uh, again, which gives us a bit of information about um, the, uh, the, the role. This is um, a training session given by Dr. Gunson to lawyers in the HIV litigation. Dr. Gunson was um, engaged as the blood transfusion expert for the defendants, uh, both the health authorities and um, central government, in that piece of litigation. And if we could pick it up at uh, page 11, 
the top of that, he says, uh, the purpose of the consultant advisor is to provide advice of a personal nature to the CMAO or nominated officers at DHSS as distinct from collective advice from the speciality as a whole. Um, and then explains why he um, had a rather different arrangement to the previous two holders of the post, who were uh, uh, Sir William Maycock and, and Dr. Tovey. Um, and then the next paragraph, he says, events were to prove, prove that my advice was required on many occasions during the next few years, since within one year the relationship between AIDS and the transfusion of blood and its products was proven. It must be recognised that my advice on these matters was on a personal basis. Responses from the service to matters concerning HIV infection, infection amongst other topics, were elicited from the chairman of the RTD committees. But just, just stopping there for a moment, he began his role in October 1981. Yes. So when he says, within one year, the relationship between AIDS and the transfusion of blood and its products was proven, yes. he's talking about before October 82. He is, and so we'll come on to look at some of the documentation and, and how, he, how he says on later reflection, at what point he says that he was um, uh, convinced that, that HIV or AIDS was, was caused by um, uh, blood transfusions. Yes. Uh, but but we'll, we'll get on to that tomorrow. Um, so, moving on then to the committees and working groups um, that Dr. Gunson participated in, and I, I should say, although there are a lot of them, I am going to mention a lot of them, uh, this is not um, a, a, an exhaustive selection. There are other party, uh, working groups, committees, and so on that he um, uh, was uh, participated in. So as a regional transfusion director, um, as one would expect, he was a regular uh, uh, attender at uh, regional transfusion director meetings. Um, and the uh, regional transfusion directors had various um, working groups and committees. Um, and he was chair of the regional transfusion directors committee called the UK AIDS Working Group. Um, the inquiry, as I understand it, has only found um, minutes of one meeting of that group um, uh, to date, but um, investigations continue. Um, he also attended the regional meetings of consultants of the Blood Transfusion Service, and so you may recall on Tuesday uh, we um, heard that Dr. Tovey had instituted uh, a, a system where there were three supra-regional group meetings, and um, Dr. Gunson, again, as one would expect as a director, attended uh, the relevant one uh, for him, which for Manchester was the Northern. Um, he also attended meetings when they occurred between regional transfusion directors and haemophilia centre directors, and we have a number of examples of uh, meetings of that nature. He was uh, a member of the advisory committee on the, national, of the, on the National Blood Transfusion Service from its inception in December 1980. And again, we heard about how that was created and the circumstances that that was created um, on Tuesday. And we looked at Tuesday uh, at the terms of reference of that group, which for uh, reference is CBLA 301207. Um, and it was to advise the DHSS and the Welsh Office on the coordination of the development and work of regional transfusion centres and central blood laboratories in England and Wales and the English and Welsh Blood Transfusion Service with those of Scotland and Northern Ireland. He chaired two of its subcommittees, uh, the Working Party to advise on plasma supplies for self-sufficiency in blood products, from February 1983, and also the Working Group on AIDS. And the, the, the names of some of these uh, committees and working groups are, are quite a mouthful. Once the National Directorate was formed in 1988 and the Advisory Committee was abolished, as we uh, heard on Tuesday, 
um, he became a, a, the, the National Management Committee of the MBTS was formed in, De uh, in December 1988. It had its first meeting, and he was, as you would expect, as National Director, a, um, a member of that committee. Um, uh, and we looked at their terms of reference on Tuesday. Uh, and he was um, a member of the UK Working Party on Transfusion Associated Hepatite Hepatitis from its inaugural meeting in September 1982. Um, and the terms of reference for that, for that can be found, and we don't need to turn this up, for, uh, CBLA 301625. And I can read those out because they're short. Um, so the terms of reference for that group were to promote the investigation of the epidemiology of transfusion-associated hepati hepatitis to promote research and to make recommendations to the director of the UK Transfusion Service regarding procedures and screening for its prevention. Between 1982 and 1988, he was a member of the Central Blood Laboratory Authority. He was chair of uh, some of their subcommittees, such as the Central Committee for Research and Development in Blood Transfusion. And he was chair of that subcommittee from June 1983. He was chair of their working group on AIDS from October 1983. Um, and the terms of reference for that group, again, we don't need to go to this, but can be found at CBLA 301754. Um, and that document says that it was set up to consider the problem of AIDS in relation to the transfusion of blood and blood product products. Uh, and that was a committee on which Professor Bloom uh, sat uh, and we can see from the minutes of, of, that, uh, of the document uh, of the first meeting that I, I've, just, I've just given the document reference for that Professor Bloom was asked to be the link between the CBLA uh, working group on AIDS and the Medical Research Council Committee on AIDS because he sat on both of those committees. Now, Professor uh, Dr. Gunson resigned from the CBLA uh, when he took up his role as National Director. Uh, to avoid any conflict should the CBLA policy materially differ from the aims of the National Blood Transfusion Service. He was a member of the National Blood Transfusion Service and CBLA Liaison Committee from January 1989. He was a member of the NIBSC, the National Institute for Biological Standards and Control, and the UK Blood Transfusion Service Liaison Group, which first met in March 1987. Um, and uh, the purpose of that committee is set out at NHBT 01088650 underscore 010. We don't need to go to that now. Um, in, in, in essence, it was to, a committee set up to formulate scientific guidelines for the standardization and safety of blood and blood products, um, and subsequently became, as I understand it, the Standing Advisory Committee on Transfusion Transmitted Infections, or SACTI. Uh, and he attended a, 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 a couple of SACTI meetings before uh, his retirement. He was also a member of the SNBTS, NBTS, so the Scottish National Blood Transfusion Service and the National Blood Transfusion, Transfusion, Transfusion Service Liaison Committee, as Ms. Richards made clear yesterday. And he, uh, the, the chair, chairmanship of that committee alternated, as I understand it, um, every meeting between Scotland and England. And he, when, when it was England's turn, he, he was chair. Uh, and they had their first meeting in January 1989. He was also um, a member, a a as you heard yesterday, sir, on the Advisory Committee on the v Virological Safety of Blood, or ACVSB, from 1988 to 1994. Um, if we can just look at the terms of reference to that committee, because I don't think we went to those yesterday. It's PRSE uh, 
3956. Uh, so we can see the um, Advisory Committee on the Virological Safety of Blood. And if we go to page four of that document, we can see it's to advise the health departments of the UK on measures to ensure the virological safety of blood whilst maintaining adequate supplies of appropriate quality for both immediate use and for plasma processing. He was also chair of the UK Advisory Committee on Transfusion Transmitted Disease, ACTDTTD, uh, and we heard yesterday um, that uh, Professor Cash in his Penrose evidence described that the, the existence of that committee as, as Dr. Gunson's brainchild. Uh, at, um, uh, that, that committee was formed in uh, February 1989. Um, uh, the terms of reference are, uh, are worth looking at. It's NHBT 0027680. Um, and if we go, please, to page three of that document, we've got the draft terms of reference to consider the epidemiological, clinical, and laboratory aspects of diseases which may be transmitted by the transfusion of blood and blood products, to determine the appropriate policy which should be implemented by the UK Blood Transfusion um, Service for the control of transfusion transmitted disease, and to advise the Department of Health accordingly. And if we go back to page two, we can see the membership includes uh, both uh, Professor Cash, Dr. Contreras, Dr. Gunson, uh, Dr. Wagstaff, Dr. Mortimer, Dr. Mitchell, and so on. Um, Dr. Gunson, um, in his statement for the HCV litigation, uh, which we find at NHBT 5026 underscore 009, address the relationship between those two committees, so the relationship between the Advisory Committee on the Virological Safety of Blood and the UK Advisory Committee on Transfusion Transmitted Disease. So if we could, we can see that's the, the, the header of, of his witness statement for the um, uh, RE-A and others um, uh, HCV, Hepatitis C litigation. Um, if we turn, uh, please, to... Uh, page 29, paragraph 73, he says this, the ACVSPB was a powerful committee, um, as was noted at the outset, it was appreciated that it would be covering many of the same issues as the ACTTTD. The relationship between the two committees was formally addressed at the meeting of the ACVSB on 24 April 1990, where the chairman proposed that it would be the responsibility of the ACVSB to advise ministers on the virological safety of blood, while the ACTTD would consider the operational implications of policy, advise the department on non-viral threats to blood, and contribute to the advice on viral safety through input to the ACVSB. I confirmed that I shared this view of the respective roles of the two committees and did not believe that it involved any conflict. It was accordingly the ACVSB, which was the leading committee in formulating policy with regard to the introduction of HCV testing. Of course, neither the committee nor I, as explained in section A, had any direct authority to impose decisions on the regions which retained operational responsibility for the RTCs. It was my role, once policy had been determined within the committees and where necessary approved by ministers, to communicate the decision to the RTDs and to make every effort to ensure their cooperation. He was also um, a, a member of the, um, uh, some committees, some of the Medical Research Council committees, 
He was a member of the Blood Transfusion Research Committee Working Party on Post-Transfusion Hepatitis, which had its first meeting in February 1980. Uh, and the terms of reference are set out, we don't need to go to this, in MRCO 5029 underscore 003. Uh, and they were to promote research and to assess the nature and size of the problem of post-transfusion hepatitis in the UK with particular reference to changes in transfusion practices. He was also a member of the Medical Research Council's Working Party on AIDS Subcommittee on Epidemiological Studies. He was a member of the Expert Advisory Group on AIDS from 1985 to 1993, as Richards took you yesterday to the terms of reference of that group. He was also a member of the Expert Advisory Group on AIDS, the EGA Screening Test Subgroup, which had its first meeting in February 1985. Um, and the terms of reference to that can be found at DHSC 40425. We don't need to go to that, but it, it, the terms of reference were to advise EGA on the introduction of an antibody test to the AIDS virus. And he was also a, a member of the EGA subgroup on AIDS counselling. He was a member of uh, uh, certainly one um, Department of Health and Social um, uh, Security Committee, um, being chair of the DHSS Plasma Supply and Blood Products Working Group Medical Subcommittee, which had its first meeting in uh, April 1988. We can see um, in uh, uh, the terms of reference, which we don't need to go to, but um, oh, well, uh, we don't need to go to, but our, our can be found at DHSC three zeros two zero one seven, um, and in that document, it, it says that the medical subcommittee needed to consider the problem of yields and how much plasma would be required for the fractionation of factor VIII and factor IX. He was also the UK representative on the Council of Europe Committee on, of Experts on Blood Transfusion and Immunohematology. Uh, they met annually. It was a forum for exchange between uh, European blood services uh, and uh, we uh, uh, have um, evidence of uh, Dr. Gunson both preparing reports for those meetings, setting out what the practice was in the UK, and reporting back from those meetings um, as to what the practice was in other European countries. He acted as expert advisor uh, to the Committee on the Safety of Medicines Subcommittee on Biological Products on the Issue of AIDS. Uh, and as I said at the beginning, um, there are other committees uh, and working groups on which he sat, which I haven't listed. But one can see the breadth um, and width of uh, his participation in the committees and, uh, and also the fact that there were so very many committees and working groups uh, meeting and making decisions over this period. Uh, we know from his, the oral evidence that uh, Dr. Gunson gave in the hepatitis, in the, um, hepatitis C litigation, A and others, that he, read, he was a regular reader of The Lancet, the BMJ, the New England Journal of Medicine, and Vox Sanguinis, um, as well as the two um, American blood journals, Transfusion and Blood. Uh, and what he said in, um, in his oral evidence uh, for uh, RIA was that uh, at Manchester, 
at the Manchester Centre, they had a comprehensive library. Um, I'm, I'm going to now look at um, uh, a document, um, one of the few documents um, <coughs> I, I, I think that we've got from um, his time in Oxford. Uh, DHSC 01000006 underscore 130. And just to remind, remind you, Sarah, and everyone that's listening, that Dr. Gunson was the director of Oxford between 1975 and March 1980. Now, this is a very poor copy, um, and it's a, not entirely clear what the date of this document was. Uh, but if we go to the um, end, the last page, we can see it's, it, it's got Dr. Gunson's name on it. And at the bottom, the last paragraph there, it says details of required expenditure are given in Appendix 2. Costs are detailed as those applicable in a full financial year and those revenue costs which will be incurred in 76 and 77. So the inference from that is that this is a document that was prepared either in probably 1975 or possibly early 1976. Yes, it, 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 uh, it, it might be uh, in the course of 76 to 77, so it's, it's, but it's within that two-year period Indeed. anyway. So if we can go back to the first page. Uh, if, if you just, sorry, come back. Um, the just above section six. Yes. Assuming yes. that the work, building work is completed by November 76, then the earliest time proposal can be implemented is 1st January 77. So this is plainly written before November 76. Yes. Uh, and one would have thought, um, given that there is an assumption relating to building work, it would be t sometime before November 76. Quite, quite. So this is a, if we go back to page one, this is a report that Dr. Gunson has produced um, addressing the need to increase uh, the quantities of plasma collected for fractionation without impacting upon the supply for blood for transfusion in hospital. So if we look at that first paragraph, it gives us um, some information about what was happening at the Oxford Regional Transfusion Service at the time. Um, at present, the Oxford Regional Transfusion Service supplies some 5,000 litres of plasma annually to the Oxford Haemophilia Centre. This is, um, this is achieved by separating the plasma from approximately 22,000 donations. Expansion plans are in hand to increase the volume of plasma supplied for fraction, fractionation to 6,500 litres per year. Although this represents an increase of only 22%, it will necessitate the handling of 36,000 donations annually since it is proposed to reduce the volume of plasma removed from each don donation to 180 mils, instead of the 210 to 20 mils removed at present. The proposal to further increase the volume of plasma for fractionation to 10,000 litres per year will involve the separation of plasma from 55,000 donations. This represents an increase of 53% above our committed expansion and an increase of 150% above our present separation. Um, and then if we can go down um, to uh, the section one, halfway down, availability of donors, um, he makes the point there that the present region serviced by the Oxford BTS does not conform to the Oxford RHA boundaries. And so that's a theme that we will see in many of the documents, that when, um, the, the, as, as we heard on Tuesday, the, the, the regional transfusion centres were formed first with their areas, and then um, the um, regional health authorities um, took them over, and the two boundaries didn't um, always uh, coincide precisely. Um, if we turn over the page, we can see um, halfway down that page, uh, little one and little two, we can see 
increasing blood collections up to 19,000 donations per year will resu result directly in an increase in the cler clerical work associated with donor call up and records. And then we have uh, Dr. Gunson setting out what the impact of that will be dependent on whether or not computerization can be brought into the, okay, into the equation. Um, and it, it can be inferred from that, perhaps, uh, that um, he was um, a fan of or, or keen on um, uh, computerization of the transfusion service. Um, and then we go down to C, uh, blood collection, and we learn from that that at present in Oxford, there are mobile blood collection teams which carry out 18 donor collections each week. And the proposed increase will require an additional three, and in some weeks, four donor clinics. Um, uh, and then if we go over the page to page three, at the bottom of page three is a section three, disposal of additional units of blood. And it says there, the regional, regional transfusion service has a reasonable balance at present with respect to blood collection and issues to hospitals. The collection of an additional 15 to 19,000 will affect this balance adversely, and it's important that it is put to effective clinical use. Uh, I'm pausing there, sir. That is, one of, again, one of the issues that we will see a return to, that once you increase the plasma for fractionation, what do you do with the balance of the blood, the red cells? Um, and, uh, and that's what Dr. Gunson here is um, grappling with. Out of the various possibilities, the one that I recommend to the Regional Health Authority is that the Oxford Blood Transfusion Service assumes responsibility for the service of those hospitals in the East Berkshire um, Area Health Authority, at present receiving their supplies of blood and blood products from the North West Thames Blood Transfusion Service. This line of, of action has several advantages, and he then sets those out, and I don't, we don't need to go to, to, to that. Um, so we can see there, here, this is an example of, of, of Dr. Gonson working out how he can improve and increase his plasma uh, supply for fractionation uh, while um, making use of the balance of the, of the blood, if I can put it that way, uh, by um, taking over supply to other hospitals. Um, and I wanted, um, sir, to draw your attention to um, a paragraph that we find on page four, uh, just above where it says section four, laboratory offices. I note that the hospital in East Berkshire, AHA, in particular Wexham, receive a considerable supply of cryoprecipitate. This presumably arises from the unavailability of AHF concentrate in the Northwest Thames region. I hope that consideration will be giving to, given to their receiving a supply of concentrate should these proposals be accepted. So um, one of the themes or issues that the inquiry will be looking at in the coming hearings is the extent to which, if at all, regional transfusion centres had a hand in or an influence over the products that um, clinicians were using. And here, Dr. Gunson appears to be expressing a view about um, what might be an appropriate product, albeit in very general terms. Um, and on that um, theme, if we can return, uh, if we can look please at NHBT 5086 underscore 009, which is the document we looked at earlier, it's the education, HIV litigation education course, um, and we go to page 11 of that document. Uh, we can see, um, I can just find it, um, which I now can't find. Um, Sorry, it's page 15, that's why.
So he's talking here about the functions of the, the work of the NBTS, um, and he uh, says that, that first, the second paragraph, another core function of, of RTCs is to provide clinical advice to hospitals in all matters relating to transfusion medicine. Um, and, uh, and so, sir, the, precisely what that means is something that the inquiry will be considering. It's not, it's not clear. Um, that that's something that can be picked up in, with, with witnesses uh, in our hearings. So I'm going to now turn to look at a, a document um, or two from uh, Dr Gunson's time in Manchester uh, to, and just reminding ourselves that that's April 1980 to October 1988. Um, I'm going to turn first of all to NHBT 0020196. So this um, uh, is, as I understand it, a statement from uh, Dr. Gunson in the HIV litigation. So if we turn, please, to page 29, we can see at the bottom it's signed, um, uh, well, I can tell you that's uh, Dr. Gunson's signature, um, and dated, it looks like the 11th of January 1989, but um, there are references in the statement to June. So it may be that that is, uh, that says June. It's, it's not very clear. Um, so if we then, uh, go back to page one of that document, he gives quite a lot of information about how, what, what it was like on the ground at, at the uh, Manchester Centre. Um, so he says um, in, that sec in that second paragraph, um, it's halfway down, he says another function in Manchester, but not in Oxford, so there's a difference in practice between the two, was the purchase of commercial materials within the RTC budget for the treatment of uh, haemophiliac patients. It was my responsibility, in conjunction with the directors of the Haemophilia Service, to negotiate the provisions of the commercial factor eight concentrates to supplement supplies from within the NHS. The regional team um, of officers, who subsequently became the regional management team, allocated a specific budget for this purpose to the Blood Transfusion Service, which was finally approved by the RHA, go over the page, From this, we purchased supplies to fulfil the diverging gap between NHS supplies and demand. In general, the Regional Health Authority allocated sufficient finance, and I am not aware of under-treatment for the lack of factor eight supplies, although some non-urgent surgical procedures were deferred. Demand certainly increased over this period. However, the North West region, in general, used less factor eight per, per, per patient per year than other regions. And so you have, will have heard some evidence from the Haemophilia Centre perspective on this, and you will need to balance this evidence against that. The North West Regional Supplies Department were involved with the negotiation with the companies. From 1982 to 1983, the regional standing financial instructions demanded that for contracts over £100,000, tenders had to be sought. The Regional Supplies Department devolved its duty to several district supplies departments, the tendering process for commercial factor eight concentrates was carried out by the supplies department. Uh, and then we can skip down to the um, uh, next paragraph. Um, uh, it, it explains that um, before orders were placed, uh, meetings were held with the haemophilia centre directors um, and uh, the, the ordering process occurred approximately, and then if we go over the, over the page, the ordering process occurred approximately once a year. Um, 
uh, and because of increased usage, it was necessary to supplement supplies of commercial factor rate in um, December and January. And then he goes on to say that Dr. Wensley, who was the Haemophilia Centre Director, was very much involved in the purchase of factor rate and the person responsible for the distribution of both commercial and NHS products from the RTC. Uh, and, uh, and Dr. Lee, consultant in charge at the Lancaster Centre, managed the supplies of Factor 8 allocated to that centre, uh, and Dr. Evans, those supplies to the Manchester Children's Hospital. Uh, and then if we go over to uh, page 11 and 12, uh, he gives us an insight into how uh, the yearly need for products was calculated in the northwest region. So at the bottom there, within the northwest region, we worked on a year-to-year -year basis with the local knowledge of consultants in the regional haemophilia service. This was based on the number of corrective surgical operations needed in the following year, together with the number of patients able to pursue a home treatment regime, with an added percentage added for emergencies. Home treatment involves extra supplies of factor eight in that a haemophiliac would inject factor eight at the commencement of a bleed without waiting to see if the bleed was serious enough for him to attend hospital for treatment. Um, the regional centres were all given plasma targets agreed by the directors and the director of BPL, and generally from 1978, these were in proportion to the region's population. And then he says, in order to monitor, monitor the targets, we, rece we received monthly statements of the amount of plasma sent to the BPL and the quantities of product returned. Uh, and then he goes on to say, that in, in addition to this, the DHSS statistical department at Blackpool received quarterly reports on a range of blood and plas plasma collections data from all RTCs, and the results collated for all regions were returned. Now, the inquiry has been looking into, it, it been trying to find this cohort of documents, um, and uh, investigations are still ongoing. Um, and then if we sl skip, go over to page 13, in the last paragraph there, although the use of cryo precipitate, um, well, in fact, the, we, perhaps we read the paragraph above, actually. Um, from 1974, RTCs removed part of the plasma from donations of whole blood shortly after its collection, and this was used. In addition to general cl clinical requirements for the preparation of cryoprecipitate and for issue to BPL for fractionation into products, nationally and also in the Northwest region, the number of donations from which plasma was removed increased in numbers. In the latter part of 1983, a nutrient solution became available so that it could be placed on the red cells after removal of all the plasma from the donation. This allowed a 50% increase of plasma to be obtained from each donation. Uh, and we'll see reference to that. Um, as one of the tools in the uh, charge for self-sufficiency. And he goes on, although the use of cryoprecipitate declined nationally between 75 and 85, the usage in the northwest region remained high as a result of the policies adopted by the regional haemophilia service. Cryoprecipitate competed with plasma sent for fractionation so that the latter targets were not achieved. However, factor eight from cryoprecipitates was used to treat haemophilia patients and this supplemented the supplies of NHS and commercial factor eight concentrates. Details of the production of cryoprecipitate and plasma for fractionation are available um, at the RTC, although for, and, and, and he goes on to say, although for some years, the RTC supplied Lancaster with cryoprecipitate. Uh, and then he goes on to set out the um, changes to the centre itself between 1982 and 1984, 
when they moved into a new um, into a new building. And then in 1985 to 1986, funding was prov provided for a plasmapheresis centre uh, and a smaller one in Lancaster. And we'll see reference to that in some of the documents we look at later. Um, so I, I'm just going to um, look also at um, DHSC 30s 2195 So this is a document, uh, a note of a meeting that took place in September 1979, so shortly before uh, Dr. Gunson moved to, from Oxford to Manchester. It's a note of a meeting of the ad hoc group of regional transfusion directors. Um, and we can see on the attendee list, it's attended by uh, Dr. Gunson. Um, and the reason I draw your attention to it, sir, is because it, it, it shows some insight into what certainly this group of people were uh, discussing about choice of product um, at, at, in September 1979. Uh, pick it up at the second paragraph. It was reported that there was not universal acceptance by directors of the proposition that blood products should be distributed by BPL proportionately to plasma supplied, but with some safeguards for regions with special problems, e.g. regions which treated haemophiliacs from other regions. It was felt that a distribution scheme on this basis would prove generally acceptable. So we saw Dr. Gonson earlier saying that the targets were set on the basis of population, and then here we see um, there being discussion about um, the blood products you receive back being uh, uh, pro rata effectively for the, for, for the plasma that you um, provided, with some exceptions, for example, uh, for the area that's served... Um, uh, Lord Trelaw's College, for example. Um, uh, and then, if we miss out the next paragraph, it goes on, a tendency to revert to cry a precipitate was discernible in some regions, due in part to lack of money to buy commercial concentrate or to collect more plasma for fractionation at BPL. It was agreed that this was yet another example of the way in which the use of blood products and the development of blood product production was being distorted by the availability of products which were apparently free. Um, Dr. Tovey said that the NBTS was at a stage where it must be decided whether the service went forward as a truly national service, properly coordinated, or as a number of regional services, each going their own way. Uh, and uh, as noted, Dr. Lane had put forward his views in a paper. Um, Dr. Bird then uh, expresses a strong view that the NBTS should generate its own revenue. Um, and then Dr. Lane draws attention to the fact that supplies of fresh frozen plasma were beginning to tail off in many regions. It was agreed that this was not the result of any shortage of donor, but was generally due to shortage of money needed to maintain the level of plasma supplies. Um, and region notes that regional health authorities are not sympathetic to requests by directors for money to finance plasma collection if they are not to receive a proportional part of the finished factor rate or PPF in return. So um, we can see there um, a suggestion that the use of cryoprecipitate um, is, uh, at least in some regions, uh, thought to be uh, high because of a lack of uh, money for either buying commercial product or uh, an ability to provide plasma to BPL uh, in order to receive products back. I'm just going to draw your attention, sir, to some of the comments, or not comments, some of the evidence, rather, that Dr. Gonson gave in the hepatitis litigation, um, which paints um, his view of the general uh, picture facing the uh, blood transfusion service 
um, uh, while he, I presume it is a little bit clear what period he's talking about, but I presume while he was um, uh, working there, uh, working full time, but it's a little bit unclear. If we can go first of all, um, please, to NHBT 40143. and page 79 of that. So we can see that's Thursday, the 19th of October, 2000. So that's the date on which um, Dr. Gunson was giving evidence. He was giving evidence, I think, for about five and a half days in all. This was, this was, um, uh, this was the first day of his evidence. Um, uh, and if we turn to page 79, um, page 79, uh, if we go to line 3917, about a third of the way down. Um, so Q is the barrister asking the question. He's being examined in chief at this stage. Something which does not appear in your statement but is perhaps useful for the court to have. It has been given already informally by my learned friend. Can we have in very round figures at the relevant times how many donations per year were made in England and Wales or collected? So it's a little bit unclear what the relevant times means. Um, he says, in England and Wales, it was roughly 2.5 million. The figures, including Scotland, was 3 million. Um, sticking with England and Wales, if at any rate that is the figure you have, about how many donors does that represent? So There's something in order of 1.5 to 1.6 million. Uh, so on average, an individual donor would give blood slightly less often than twice a year. He says, yes, many, well, many donors give blood twice a year, but there were some particularly commercial sites that we only visited once a year because you could not disrupt the work of the factory. Um, and then uh, it goes on to question 3939, just to get an idea of sizes, about how many donations would be collected by the largest of the centres. Answer, I think the largest centre was undoubtedly South London, and they collected something at that time in the order of 250,000 donations a year. The smallest, uh, and the question, the smallest, I think, and answer something in the order of 80,000 to 100,000. And then if we go over the page, just one other general question. What is the broad turnover in the donor population? How many donors do you lose a year? An answer from retirement illness, donors moving from one venue to another, it's something in the order of 12 to 15% per year. Question, people just getting busier and answer and stopping, yes. Um, and then if we go, um, please, to NHBT 40146. It's so page 95. This is um, Dr. Gunson giving evidence on the 24th of October 2000. Um, and if we go to the bottom of that um, paragraph, page, rather, he, he, he's still being examined in chief at this stage by his counsel, Mr. Underhill. Uh, what you say in paragraph 20 is that the blood supply within the service was a constant source of concern. And during the period with which we are... We go over the page concerned here, you spent several hours most days ensuring that blood supply met demand throughout the country. Is that an exaggeration? Answer, no, it's not an exaggeration at all. I spent lo a long time, and so did many other members of the staff at the directorate, trying to locate centres who could supply blood to other centres where there was a shortage. So we know here that he's talking about um, post-creation of the National Directorate. Um, the critical day, I have to tell you, in the week was Friday, when most of our time was spent on this activity and it was made more difficult because even those centres who had a good stock of blood did not particularly want to give it away in case they had emergencies they were unaware of come in during the weekend and they could find themselves then short. So it took a great deal of persuasion to obtain agreement to transfer, transfer blood from, say, Sheffield to London. Question, yes. Answer. But the London centres all had difficulties, virtually on a daily basis, particularly, I have to say, North London, where they have to supply a large number of teaching hospitals. Um, and then the last um, passage, uh, sir, is NHBT zero, uh, 40148, 
uh, underscore zero zero one. Uh, and this is uh, evidence given on th Thursday, the 26th of October. You can see at the top there. And this is during cross-examination. Uh, and if we go to page five... He gives some evidence about the supply in Manchester. And if we go down to line 226, in fact, 221, um, we better start at the question. Um, sort of ha halfway, uh, so actually not halfway through line 223, just give us a feel for how you say the problem of supply was between these these years, 1987 and 1991, that sort of period. Answer. Well, between 1987 and 1988, I was the director of the centre in Manchester, and I was not the national director. Therefore, I just ran a transfusion centre like my colleagues. We had considerable difficulties at certain times of the year, particularly during the school holidays and particularly around Christmas time, when we had a significant drop in donors, and it was always extraordinarily difficult then to catch up. And there were several instances during that period 1987 to 1988, the hospitals had to cancel routine surgery because there was insufficient blood supply available. And this got into the press on a number of occasions. And then he says, when I became the national director, I established the system of having... Um, and then there's a discussion about when that was. And he says down... Uh, 243, I established a system whereby each transfusion centre sent me their stock levels for that day and any requests that they had for shortage of blood. And we then, in the National Directorate, endeavoured to supply this blood from other centres, and indeed from Scotland as well. Uh, were you successful during that period? During that period, we were extremely successful. There was not, I do not think, one critical report in the press during the whole of the period until 1993. Um, so I'll just... Uh, then can we turn now to DHSC um, zero, three zeros two one nine five underscore zero four four uh, so this is a document I think this is the document we've just looked at. Well, that's, that's what yes. I think, yes, it is. <laughs> Forgive me, it's the document we've just looked at. So, um, let's not look at that again. <laughs> um, so, uh, can we look, we look now at DHSC uh, th three zeros two two zero seven underscore zero four zero. So this uh, is, uh, I'm, going, I'm, I'm, I'm looking now at, at documents um, concerned with, or parts of documents concerned with the drive towards self-sufficiency. Um, so this is uh, a report, uh, or, uh, or at, at the top of the um, page, it, it calls itself a draft for discussion. Um, for, of the for the advisory committee for the National Blood Transfusion Ser Services Working Party to advise on plasma supplies for self-sufficiency in blood products in England and Wales. And we can see under membership of the Working Party that that includes uh, Dr. Gunson. And at the bottom of that page, we can see that it's, it's, it's um, dated June 1981. So if we go over to page two... Uh, and at paragraph uh, 2.1, we can see there that the requirement for factor eight is set up, set out. And it says, representatives of the haemophilia directors estimate that by the mid-1980s, the annual requirement for factor eight will reach 100 million units for the United Kingdom. Forecasting beyond that time could not be accurate, but it was considered that by the 1990s, the need for factor eight could reach 150 million units per year. 
and goes on to set out some requirements for albumin. And then at paragraph three, it says, it was agreed that the estimates for plasma supply should be based upon that required to produce 100 million units. Um, although this total was estimated for the UK for the mid-1980s, it was considered to be unnecessary to correct this for that required in Scotland or to consider a higher figure than this since estimates were vague for a longer period. Um, and then we go over the page to page four where there is a discussion about the type of factor eight preparation required. So what is that 100 million units going to... Sorry, to page three. I beg your pardon. Thank you. What is that... One, how is that 100 million units going to be made up um, and it says there, the working party has examined the various products available and considered the advantages and disadvantages of each, which are discussed in Appendix 1. Um, uh, and it's just worth going to have a look at what's said at Appendix 1. It's page 9 of the report. Um, and it sets out the different kinds of products provided and produced in, 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 at the RTCs. Fresh frozen plasma prepared at RTCs, and while valuable source of coagulation factors, it cannot play a part in the treatment of haemophilia A. Frozen cryoprecipitate is pre presented for clinical use in the transfer pa pack in which it is prepared. It's prepared in RTCs, but it's difficult to have a national program based on this product because high yield is not always attained, attained in large-scale production. Lack of confidence in the factor VIII contact leads, content sorry, leads to overordering and waste. See, there is a significant incidence of adverse reactions due to the presence of residual plasma. The product is not convenient to store, transport and infuse, particularly for home or cell therapy. There are difficulties in ensuring adequate quality assurance and control. And so you've heard um, similar evidence from a number of, of, of haemophilia clinicians. Uh, three, freeze-dry cryoprecipitate. Small pool. 8 to 12 donations is produced in the central laboratories as the, pro as the primary factor 8 product in Finland, Switzerland and the Netherlands. The aim is to obtain a high yield and minimum donor exposure. However, all product production methods involve multiple aseptic connections with, without terminal sterilising of filtration of the product and spin freezing of a relatively dilute solution of factor 8 before drying introduces intractable problems of hygiene and thus maintenance of good manufacturing pra practice required in the UK will be very difficult. Large pool, two approaches have been used. In Belgium, about 1,000 cryoprecipitates prepared at RTCs are transported to the fractionation centre, pooled aseptically without, without, sterilize, without sterilising filtration. The pool dispensed in 50 to 100 ml volumes, spin frozen and freeze dried, and then it sets out what the process is in France, of a, a large pool, again, of about 1,000 donations. And then it says, advantages over small pools are greater consistency on the product and are potentially more secure, and a representative sample can be taken for quality control. However, sterilising filtration is expensive in yield, and 10% may be lost in rigorous quality control, and the GMP problems a spin freezing remain. And then over the two pages, please, to page 11, we then get intermediate purity concentrates, um, begin with large pool, 500 to 5,000 donations, cryoprecipitation of plasma, process to give high potency, um, uh, and then uh, it's estimated at BPL that approximately 27% of the initial factor eight activity is lost in this preparation. It does not occur in freeze-drying large pool cryoprecipitate uh, methods being examined to reduce those losses. And then it goes on to talk about higher, higher pu high purity concentrate with further purification expensive in yield. Uh, and there's a table that accompany accompanies this appendix, which we find at page 10, which sets out on the left-hand side the different products and across the, across the top, pool size, yield, etc., advantages and disadvantages. Um, and the reason I want to draw your attention to this, uh, sir, is because there is only one reference in this document and, in fact, in the whole appendix when looking at the advantages and disadvantages of the different products to uh, uh, infection via transmission. Uh, and we see that 
uh, at freeze-dried cry cryoprecipitate B large pool. And if you go over to the disadvantages, we see the GMP problems, which we've just seen in the text, larger pool for HB transmission, uh, hepatitis B transmission, um, and then the um, hygiene problems uh, with sterilization and so on. So that's what that appendix says. So if we then come back to uh, page three of the document, uh, where they are talking about types of factor eight preparation required, if we go halfway down, it was agreed that um, although the above proportions of the various products were not fully agreed, they served as a good basis for the termination of plasma needs. And they set out that in total of the 100 million units of factor eight, they would have 10 million units of freeze-dry cryoprecipitate, 80 million of intermediate purity concentrate, and 10 of high purity. And then they set out what the different yields are for the different product. Freeze-dry cryoprecipitate, 350 units per kilo, and then and that reduces up down to 90 for the high purity. Uh, and then at, at paragraph six, or section six, uh, they discuss the amount of plasma that would be required in order to meet uh, those uh, targets. And so to get um, uh, the amount, the 10 million units of uh, freeze-dried cryoprecipitate, cryoprecipitate it involves 28,500 kilograms of plasma. For the intermediate purity concentrate, 350,000 kilograms. And for the high purity, 110,000, making a total of 488,500 kilos, which they round up at the bottom for an annual aim of 500,000 kilograms of plasma. And then over the page, they, say, they set out the methods of obtaining that. First of all, looking at the yield of plasma from donations of whole blood, uh, and they set out there that, um, uh, that during 1980, just over 2 million donations of whole blood were collected by the RTCs. Uh, and they go on to say that it's difficult uh, to forecast the need for red cells in the mid-1980s, but the working party consider a total of 2.2 million donations was a reasonable estimate. Um, and so, um, uh, and they estimate that plasma from 51% of the donations could be separated within 18 hours uh, with adequate facilities and staff, which will realise some 200,000 kilograms of plasma for fractionation. So 200,000 out of the 500,000 from whole blood. Uh, and then uh, they go on to look at how to produce the balance of the 300,000 kilograms of fresh plasma. Uh, first of all, um, increase the collection of whole blood, uh, and they say there that that would require 5.5 million donations annually, which would inevitably lead to waste, and the working part party do not consider this to be a viable proposition. So that's the waste of the, the balance, the red cells and so on. Um, then they go on to look at int the introduction of plasmapheresis uh, and uh, set out the two different um, uh, methods of plasmapheresis, manual and machine. Uh, and the advantages and disadvantages. Manual is, is, is slower, um, a machine is much faster. Uh, and at the bottom there, uh, the working party recommends that the balance of 300,000 kilograms of fresh um, uh, plasma is collected by plasmapheresis. This will require the establishment of plasmapheresis centers in the regions and the recruitment of donor panels to service them. Machine procedures were in general preferred, but manual pheresis could be undertaken in favourable circumstances. And then uh, the report um, concludes um, over the page at, at um, page six. Uh, regional self-sufficiency. It is assumed that the usage of factor eight concentrates will be pro rata to population, the amounts of plasma to be collected by each region by plasmapheresis and the estimated number of plasmapheresis units is shown in Table 3. This assumes that 10,000 kilograms will approximately be, will be collected in an eight-bedded unit per year. However, it is known that the use of factor eight is not the same in each region, which will lead to anomalies. Thus, some regions would have to expend large sums to achieve self-sufficiency, while others could achieve this state relatively easily. Until self-sufficiency is reached, every region has an incentive to produce as much fresh plasma as possible. 
Thereafter, there is no incentive unless surplus plasma can be offered elsewhere with suitable financial re re recompensation. Um, also, the situation may arise where an RTC cannot provide sufficient plasma due to lack of facilities, which cannot easily be remedied. It is clear that further consideration must be given to this aspect. And so I understand the reference there to the, um, uh, every region having an incentive to produce um, uh, fresh, uh, as much fresh plasma as possible um, it, until self-sufficiency is reached to be a reference to regional self-sufficiency, not national self-sufficiency. So I, I note the time. Uh, is... Yes. So, yes. Well, self-sufficiency self across the board, I think, is what it could be meaning, couldn't it? Well, the, um, the incentive for the region <clears throat> to... Um, produce plasma is because they will get back pro rata what they um, what they give um, once they've made enough. I, I, mean, I follow the point. Yes. It, it's, um, it doesn't much matter because the, the, um, the, the view is the same that unless yes. and until there's enough produced in each region um, that, that uh, there won't be any incentive for, or there won't be a, an achievement of self-sufficiency across the board. Yes. Um, so it would now be a convenient time for a break? Uh, yes, it would. Um, so we'll, we'll meet uh, uh, again then at, uh, at, at 10 to 4.